everyone welcome back to the us individual taxation class of the sources of all income this is part 3 please go through the part 1 and part 2 because this is in continuation of the same in this session we'll be covering in detail about the deduction from gross income to arrive at agi and then we'll be covering itemized deduction so let's dive into for more detail everyone welcome to the us taxation class part 1 which is like individual taxation so far if you have seen in last three class we have covered like complete introduction of the us taxation course right what all you can expect and how those are being tested in the examination right uh, then if you remember we have done like complete overview in which we have been walk you through the entire course curriculum including you know like topic by topic and chapter by chapter the details all coming in individual taxation exam right uh, then if you remember we discuss on like all the tax laws basis which all these notes has been prepared which i am sharing with you and all the book context has been written through the those laws right and then after uh, we discuss in detail about like exam pattern uh, uh, how your exams would be look like and what all things uh, you can expect and how much question you can expect from each topic and each chapter right those all things we have discussed in detail and then if you remember we discussed certain terminologies right which are like uh, definition probably new to know new to you guys and you guys might not be used to uh, uh, those terminology in context of like indian tax laws or maybe like whatever you have studied earlier right and uh, then if you remember like we we discuss on form 1040 which is uh, individual income tax filing form uh, we touch base like all kind of categories in those forms and uh, that i shared with you as well right did you guys get a chance to look at those forms 1040 right uh, have you guys yeah, got a chance yeah. to look at those yeah yeah right because that will be like practically day in day out you might be using that form so make yourself very much familiar and comfortable uh, with the form 1040 that is specific for the individual income tax return filing form right and then we touch base on 1040x as well that is being for revised return filing form right and uh, if you remember like uh, we have been gone through the irs website scroll through all the you can say uh, required resources available in the irs website and how to be the withholding tax income tax advance tax estimated tax uh, through the income tax irs website so those all things we have been gone through in the class 1 and then if you see uh, in the class 2 we have started uh, the main topic which is our chapter 1 so in the chapter 1 if you have remember in the last weekend we have covered almost i think 45 or 46 pages of your book right <laughs> so that include you know like uh, the first one was the residential status i think uh, we have covered in that we discuss in detail about you know use of prior year returns what all benefits or what all information we can look at in the prior year return and how those prior year returns are being beneficial uh, or maybe time saving when you filing the return for the current year uh then second important topic which is being like heavily tested in the exam is about like residential status so that also we have discussed uh, in the in first chapter very first class where we discuss about both category of residential status first one is like resident and the second one is non resident aliens right then after another important topic which is you know very much tested in exam is about tax filing status what are those five tax filing status do you guys remember single gmfs hmm qualifying widow or dependent child hoh hmm yeah so filing single married filing jointly married filing separately head of the household and qualified widow so we discuss about all this uh, five category of tax filing status and what all uh, you know like things need to satisfy to consider especially for married filing jointly 
head of the household and qualified widowers. So these three are, you can see filing status in which they, they get like tax advantages position most of the time, right? So we discuss all those requirement as well, which is uh, required to, to qualify an individual for filing of these category of return, which are tax advantages position in general, right? Uh, then in the last class, we have started the sources of all income. So where we have discussed the list, laundry list of all category of income and those uh, category of income, which we have discussed in the class was more of, you can say illustrative list, but not exhaustive list because like income can be from any source, right? That should be added into the taxable income. But we have discussed like high level most of the time, uh, which we have experience in the exam what all category of income they test. So that all we have covered uh, in the all sources of income. Uh, then in the second half of the last class, we started on adjustment to the gross income. So in adjustment to the gross income are basically, uh, you can say the expenses or you can say the incomes which are not taxable income can be reduced from like your routine income or total income, right? That include, you know, uh, self-employment, health insurance, we have discussed. Uh, then I think we discuss on uh, student loan and the uh, repayment of student loan uh, considered in the CARES Act 2020, uh, 2020 and uh, interest on the student loan. Then after uh, another one, we discuss about like tuition fees. Uh, and then we discuss on educator expense, which is for like teachers, I think $250 a year kind of things, right? Then we discuss on health saving account, which is like an saving account, or you can see current account, in which uh, employer and employee can maintain certain balance for the, uh, for which like employee can spend for the uh, health related expenditure. And then we discuss on other health coverage. And lastly, I think we touch base on alimony expenses. So alimony is before 2018 and after 2018, right? So alimony received before 2018 is when you are taxable income and alimony received for the court degree before 2018 is being taxable income, but alimony paid uh, before the uh, 2018 court degree that is considered as an expense. But if the alimony is paid or received, after 2018, any against the code degree which is received after 2018, that is not neither considered an income for the person who is receiving nor considered as an expenditure for the person who is paying, right? So, so far we have covered all these topics, right? Uh, do you guys have any doubt from any of the previous class or anything you guys need more clarification before we start new topic of the day that is being deduction from gross income. Any doubt guys? So far so good? Yes. Yes, yeah, okay. So let me present my screen and uh, we can look at our notes. Okay, see. So if you see in the chapter one, we have covered all these topics, all these topics we have covered so far. So today we'll be covering this standard deduction and itemized deduction. And tomorrow we'll be finishing off all this rest of this, that is tax credits and uh, then tax payments and special filing and reporting. So today our main topic is deduction from gross income, right? If you go through all your notes, Hope you remember like <laughs> all these notes. Did you guys get a chance to look at the notes during the weekday? You guys got a chance to look at the notes? Yes, sir. Huh? Yes. <laughs> okay. Any of you got a chance to practice some multiple choice questions? No, sir. No? Please do that practice. You know, once you do the practice, then probably uh, you, your mind start boggling around like how it comes in exam, then you may have like more doubts to discuss in the classroom. So at least, you know, like uh, now we have just two months to sit for the exam, right? So every day you should invest at least one and a half or two hour 
uh, looking at the multiple choice question and do the practice of those questions. So that's very important because if you do not familiarize yourself with those multiple choice question and practice question, uh, then probably in the last minute you might be struggling. But before jumping into, you know, like uh, deductions, so I wanted to show you this chart again, you know, how the computation of income and calculation of taxes and credits happen. So hope you remember like this, this one, right? The first one is like total income, which include all categories of income, which we have discussed about, you know, I think we have covered almost 19 category of income and those all are illustrative list, not exhaustive list. Then we covered like exclusion from those income. So these two part is being already covered. So now we know how to calculate gross income, right? Now in today class, we'll be discussing about this point, which is deduction from the gross income to arrive at the adjusted gross income. So today we'll be covering this and tomorrow we'll be covering the rest of these points, right? So this is, you can say the guiding, uh, you can say, uh, Mm, computation or guiding, uh, you can say the page for you, like how the tax flows, basically calculation flows, right? So now in the last class, we have covered all these and I think I've shared the notes as well with you. Hope you might have gone through every notes and we have done like these practice question also, right? Right, hope you have done this practice question as well in the last class. Yes, sir. Right. So yes. we are done till here. Now we are jumping into the new topic, which is deduction from gross income. So like we discussed earlier also, there are two types of deduction. One is standard deduction and the second one is itemized deduction. So you can choose either standard deduction or itemized deduction. You cannot choose both the deductions. Right. This is something different than how we calculate taxes in India and how we calculate taxes in United States of America. If you remember, like I know some of you are like chartered accountant or some of you are lawyers and you have been uh, practicing Indian income tax. So you remember like in India, we have standard deduction that is applicable to everyone, almost all the individuals. Right. And then after we have deduction under section 80. Uh, in which like ADC is the majorly we use for uh, most of our client, right? For most of the people, which include like any LIC purchase, any uh, medical insurance purchase, or you can say any uh, health insurance purchase for all those things, right? PPF and all those stuff, right? But in US, you have, you need to choose either you want to apply for standard deduction or you want to go those category of deduction, which in India we use in section 80, right? But you cannot use both. So there as a tax practitioner, we need to evaluate which one is more beneficial for our client, right? That's the most important thing. Uh, before filing the income tax return of the individual as a taxpayer or as an Tax advisor is being our responsibility to evaluate both the option and suggest the better option to the client so that his or her tax liability will be minimum, right? So standard deduction, uh, uh, before we jump into the standard deduction, let's look at these two, three points only. In case of married filing jointly, both the spouses need to opt any one option. So when both of them, husband and wife, they are filing jointly return, right? In that case of scenario, it should not be possible that one person opt for standard deduction and another person will opt for itemized deduction. No, now they are filing jointly. So they can opt either standard deduction for both of them or itemized deduction for both of them. They cannot choose different options, right? Make sense? Do you remember married filing jointly? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Means there is a one income tax return for both the spouses. Right? When you are filing one income tax return, then you need to choose one option. Right? You cannot say for husband standard deduction and for wife itemized deduction. No. So you need to choose one option. Hmm? It is not permissible that one spouse choose standard deduction and the other spouse choose 
itemized deduction right and then there are certain additional standard deduction for the age 65 or greater and for the blind person so we'll be discussing that so now look at the note one where the amount has been mentioned for the standard deduction for the financial year 2021 which is coming into your exam right for unmarried people that means single right unmarried people would be filing single so for them standard deduction is twelve thousand five fifty dollar a year right and if the single or unmarried person is more than 18 uh, more than 65 year age or he or she is blind then addition additional seventeen hundred dollar would be added into the standard deduction so the standard deduction will be one uh, twelve thousand five fifty plus how much seventeen hundred one two five five zero plus one seven zero zero that means fourteen thousand two fifty dollar will be the standard deduction if the individual is unmarried or uh, you can say uh, he got legally separated and filing singly and more than 65 years of age, then he or she will get both the benefits, right? Second was is married filing jointly. So married filing jointly is 25,100. 25,100 is the standard deduction which is almost double than 12,550, right? And then in case they are more than 65 years, right? Then 1350 for each individual. For example, if husband is more than 65 year age and the wife is less than 65 year of age, right? In that case of scenario, if they are filing jointly, they will be getting the standard deduction of 25,100 plus 1350 for the husband, right? If both the spouses are more than 65, then they will get 2,700 additional deduction. Make sense? Or any doubt? Hmm? Rajat, Vivek? Uh, Kamal, yeah. where in the book this is written? Like if it is always good if we have it uh, in front of us. So where in the book it is written? Yeah, it's page in page number, number 43 onward. It's there. 42. Yeah, so it's being in page number 42, 43. So like uh, so far we have covered, I think, till page number 41 till last class. So today and tomorrow we'll be covering from page number 43 to 75. So we'll be finishing off chapter one today. Oh, today and tomorrow. Okay, thank you. Hmm. Right, and these notes are kind of like very condensed version, uh, so that you know, in the last minute, you just scroll through the notes and and you are done for your revision for chart. <laughs> and you are not required to look at right, left, and center. So it will be covering more than required uh, for your examination purpose. Um, sir, I have a similar doubt, sir. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Uh, like after the class so i feel i just this is that like the condensed version so if i want to refer from the book onwards so mm -hmm. so like uh, if there are many sections sir like uh, i'm not able to go up that right i'm not which able one? To get... which one so uh, i just uh, learned about i just saw a, a married and jointly and there were subsections also mm -hmm. so now i'm confused that i have to study i of course i have to study that but uh, like mm -hmm. they are so in a huge manner so i'm not able to. yes exactly mm -hmm. yeah yeah that's the reason i opened the book like which topic you're saying so like uh this uh like i we have i'm not able to get that section sir which section this see this is like I, I get your... many subsections so that's why i'm a bit confused no like uh if you just read through like this very plain english and uh in that like everything is being covered in the notes which i'm sharing with you so don't worry, nothing will missed out. So there might be like uh, in the pointer manner rather than like more of illustrative of they have mentioned in the book, but the notes will be covering 100% for sure. Okay, okay. So we'll not be missing out even a single line. 
but yes. you know like will be uh, in here it might be more in explanatory form but there it will be like crux of the point and that is what you need to uh, have an understanding when you are sitting for the exam so it will save like lot of your time for the revision yes oh. but still if you see any specific uh, topic in the book when you are reading and you are not comfortable in understanding that then you are more than welcome to say like this is uh, 1111.64 this is the point i am not comfortable kamal can we uh, go through this section in class so i'll be more than happy to go through those respective section in the class and then you know like maybe when you are doing practice any question you are not comfortable answering or you are not comfortable with the solution which is mentioned in the uh, you can say in your software then we are more than uh, more than happy to discuss those question for the benefit of everyone in the class as well right mm -hmm. but if you just That's simply say is like uh, you know i'm not able to get it then <laughs> to be very honest yeah, and, and no answer to that is one section just a single page so that's why i got a bit uh, like you know be be specific to your question which yes. topic you know you need more clarification we are more than so happy to discuss the first you told us that we have to like just saw the book so i just uh, saw that and uh, i just realized that it is just a plain and uh, your notes are your notes are like much very clarified mm -hmm. so a bit uh, i just see, like if you see everything like these all things if you see these all things we have already we have covered like everything but you know like th that's more you can say like i feel from the student perspective if you see like these all maybe more in tabular format kind of things if you see like we have covered almost everything we are not leaving anything like yes. which is not in book yes don't don't yes. worry about that <laughs> again that right yeah shelly any question no sir fine cool cool okay so let's jump back where we were on the deduction side right so we have covered like merit filing jointly third one is qualify widower with dependent child see their deduction is also 25100 right so like we were discussing earlier what all ben additional benefit that a qualified widower with dependent child get they get almost all the similar benefit of like merit filing jointly up to 2 years right which we have discussed earlier so here it is 25100 as a standard deduction and then if you see head of the household head of the household even a single person but they are maintaining like dependent child and they can claim a head of household position and if you see their standard deduction is 18800 compared to 12550 if you have been chosen only a single status then you might have taken a deduction of 12550 but if you are taking care of any dependent in your family then you can claim head of the household so we discuss all like the requirement for head of the household right hope you remember or gone through the notes right but now slowly and gradually as we get more into detail you will see what in the first class which we were discussing like these are most advantageous position for the tax purpose now slowly and gradually as we get into the details one by one you'll see like why we were saying those merit filing jointly head of the household qualified widowers are being at more advantageous position because if you see their their standard deduction is almost double right and for head of the household it's almost 1.5 times right the next one is merit filing separately right for them also 12000 550 and for them like additional deduction for being like more than 65 or if the person is blind is 1300 so these are like standard deduction you just need to memorize the number based on the categories right make sense any doubt so far on standard deduction no sir no Right. Sir, I have a doubt. Yes, please. Like we in India, we have uh, slabs mm. on the income. Mm -hmm. Like, for example, from certain amount to certain amount, this is the percentage. Mm -hmm. In US, is it fixed? 
or is it also something similar to like we have from no that that will be coming when we are come to tax rates so those okay. slabs are tax rates like in how much to how much taxable income need to be taxed at 10% from there to there 20% and then onward you know 30% so that will be like the next chapter when we come to the income tax calculation right But as of now deductions are fixed these are standard deduction in india also standard deduction is always fixed okay okay right so don't confuse like tax rate with the standard deduction as yeah, of now that, that is what i was yeah so yes. you know like uh, if you go back these two are different things i was mixing yeah. it so there you go so here when we come to this stage yeah, then yeah, you will see like which tax rate is being applicable to which income as of now today we will be covering only this one deduction from gross income got it got it got it hmm? Good. So, if both the person are blind and above the sixty-five year of age, then they both are being eligible to claim double deduction, as well as blind deduction and the sixty-five year age deduction. Both, for example, married filing jointly, they both are more than sixty-five. So, right? it's it's fifty-four hundred. Yeah. Yes, absolutely true. Right, and look at the note here. married filing jointly both the spouse need to choose one option either standard deduction or itemized deduction which we have discussed above as well different option for different spouse is not permissible now coming to some additional deduction also available for the dependent right so we'll be discussing what all are dependents uh, we will be discussing today the definition of dependent as well but as of now just keep in mind there is one person for whom you are taking care it can be your child it can be your step child it can be child of your you know husband child of your wife or maybe you know like brother sister parent we'll be discussing all those things in detail like what all comes in the dependent category hmm? So as of now, just keep in mind if you are maintaining a dependent, then you'll get a additional standard deduction for the dependent, which is one thousand one hundred dollar for each dependent. The individual's earned income for the year plus three fifty dollar for twenty twenty one, but not more than regular standard deduction amount of twelve thousand five fifty for. 2021 that means the person who is being dependent for which for whom you are claiming the additional standard deduction that person that dependent person should not be earning the income more than 12550 right so he or she maybe there is a child who may be like good in sports and they may he may get some scholarship or some reward money something right but that should not be more than 12000 Five fifty. If it is more than twelve thousand five fifty, then you cannot claim that child as a dependent standard deduction for that. Right? That is the only thing you need to keep in mind. Next one is standard deduction is not allowed to whom? For the people like us who are non-resident alien, for us standard deduction is not allowed. So who all are non-resident uh, non alien? Do you remember from the very first class? Hmm? The green card and who doesn't meet the substantial burden test? Ah, uh, sir, so not a green card holder. Hmm. Yeah. What else? Sir, who is not a U.S. resident? Hmm. Ah. Uh -huh. Ah. Uh, he is not uh, fulfilling the condition which is laid down. Mm -hmm. What um, were those conditions? <laughs> which is, uh, I, I think, the, that's the question. Million dollar question. One eighty three days. Say that again. One eighty three days. Mm hmm. What else? Three years. One eighty three days. One eighty three days and three years. Uh, mm -hmm. in one year, I think this is thirty-one days, and next mm -hmm. two years, uh, mm -hmm. is a balance. If he is not fulfilling this condition, is uh, he is uh, uh, he is not considered as a 
resident of USA. Right. So see, like these are the notes which I have shared with you. So who are the resident alien? Green card holder, right? Non-resident alien who is married with the citizen and the taxpayer physically present in US and satisfy these three conditions are being considered as a resident alien. The person who is not satisfying any of these three conditions are called non-resident alien, right? Most of the time, uh, we people go to the US and do some work and most of the time like our status is non-resident alien. So if we are non-resident alien, then we cannot claim standard deduction, right? So just keep in mind, this is a very important point when you start working as a tax practitioner. First, you need to understand whether the person is being resident or not. If the person is not resident, then you are no choice of sender deduction, right? So if you remember, like earlier we were discussing, you need to choose either sender deduction or itemized deduction, right? Which one is more beneficial for your customer or for your client. But if your client is a non-resident alien, then choice of sender deduction is not available, right? So then you need to go to the itemized deduction only. Make sense? These kind of, you know, tax advice you might be giving to your client. Make sense? Vivek, Rajat? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Hmm? Yes, right? sir. Yes. So taxpayer who are filing for a period less than 12 months also, they're also not eligible for the standard deduction. So two, two category of people are not eligible for the standard deduction. One is non-resident alien. And the second is the taxpayer who are filing for a period of less than 12 months. So who are who are those people who are filing for a period of less than 12 months? So for example, any of your client have started like a sole proprietor business, right? Doing a like small shop or maybe small manufacturing setup or might be providing professional service individually. And he has, or he or she have started that probably let's say in July or August month, right? For him, the financial year, like Jan to December, but he has worked only for let's say five months or six months. So he'll be filing for a period of less than, he or she will be filing for a period of less than 12 month taxable income, right? Make sense? Yes. Yes, no? Yes, yes. So he or she is not eligible for the standard deduction. He or she need to go with the itemized deduction only. Right? Make sense? Okay, sir. Now, let's understand what is itemized deduction. What all include in the itemized deduction? First one is medical or dental care expenses, which are not reimbursed by insurance company or by the employer. That means the expenses which you incurred from your own pocket, right? So the deduction limit for the expenditure is in excess of 7.5% of the AGI are deducted. That means if your adjusted gross income, what is adjusted gross income? Total income minus exclusion from the income. That is adjusted gross income. So 7.5% of adjusted gross income. Maybe I can do a math for you uh, to explain it better. Okay. Can you all see the whiteboard? Yes, sir. Okay. So what does it mean? 7.5% of AJ. For example, you are a professional. Your client is a professional. And he earned income of say, let's say dollar 200,000, right? And you can say um, allowable expenses. He incurred, let's say dollar 60,000. Hmm? So he's adjusted, so his gross income Adjusted gross income is dollar 
140,000, right? And he has incurred, let's say, $15,000 expense on medical, right? So here they are saying 1,40,000, 140,000 multiplied by 7.5%. How much is it? Can somebody do the math for me? 7.5% of 140,000? 10,500. 10,000. 10,500. Right? Whereas, how much he has incurred? 15,000. Right? So, the itemized deduction. He can apply is dollar 15,000. That is the amount he has spent minus dollar 10,500. That is 4,500 only. So, this is amount he or she can claim as a itemized deduction for medical expenditure or dental care expenditure. Make sense? Uh, sir, it will be meant with 7.5% of 15,000. 7.5% of AGI. So, over and above this, whatever the expenditure you have made on the medical expenditure you have made, over and above 75, 7.5% of AGI. Okay. So, let me take you to the notes. One second. Deduction limit is expenditure in excess of 7.5% of AGI. That means the expenditure which you have incurred more than 7.5% of AGI. They are saying up to 7.5% of AGI is the normal expenditure on the medical expense that an individual make. If he or she is making more than 7.5%, that means uh, uh, he or she is being like seriously injured, right? Or may have some medical assistance requirement or required some medical support. For that, that is the reason taxpayer uh, tax laws are being lenient for him or her. Make sense? So if you look at from the tax maker standpoint of view, right? What tax maker wants for their citizen? If they are incurring too much expenditure on medical expense, they would love to support them, right? Mm -hmm. Make sense? Right? So for that, they have considered a threshold limit. That means if a normal citizen, then this number also comes from the national average data somewhere at 7.5%. So normally, they might have done like census analysis and come up with the certain percentage that a normal person spend on the medical expense in a year, right? So if somebody is spending more than that, that means he or she is needing some medical assistance or additional medical assistance. And the government wants to support them by reducing their tax liability on the additional amount they have spent, right? Remember Robin Hood rule? Yes, yes. Right, makes sense? Yes, Rajat, Garima. Yes, sir. Yeah. Divya. Yes. yes, 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 sir. Right, so far so good. Yes, sir. Yes. So first one is medical and dental care. For that limit is more than seven point five percent of AGI, the amount you are spending on medical or dental care expense, which is not being reimbursed by insurance company or by the employer. Right? If it is being reimbursed by employer, then also it's not allowed. And if it is being reimbursed by insurance company, then also it's not allowed. For the financial year 2020, the limit has increased to 10%. For example, if in your question comes anything relating to 2020, so you should be aware of that because of the CARES Act. Due to COVID situation, people are spending more money on their health care. So that point of time, they have increased the bar to 10% instead of 7.5%, right? Second itemized deduction is 
state and local taxes include real estate tax right this is to state government or to the local government which is city government or municipality government so any taxes you are paying to the state government or to the municipal uh, municipal government or to the city government up to dollar 10000 is being allowed as an itemized deduction so if you are paying more than 10000 dollar then maximum 10000 is being allowed like for example let me do an example for you so for example uh, you are in texas so let's say you are in texas mr a lives in texas and he purchases new home of let's say dollar 500000 texas is expensive right so he purchases a condo of 500000 dollars and on that he paid state tax at the rate of let's say 2% and city tax at the rate of 1% hmm then how much deduction is allowed hmm so 2% of 500000 how much 10000 hmm 10000 dollars and city tax Dollar five thousand, right? Total he paid how much? Fifteen thousand. Maximum allowed is ten thousand. Fifteen thousand or ten thousand, whichever is lower. That is dollar ten thousand, right? Makes sense. Yes, no. Yes, yes, yes. Hmm. Or now, if you, hmm. Yeah, Divya, any doubt? No, sir. No, sir. Hmm? If instead of this two percent, if it is let's say one percent, and instead of one percent, this is zero point five percent, then what will be your answer? Dollar five thousand is for state tax, and dollar two thousand five hundred is for city tax that is dollar 7500 is the total tax pay so in that case maximum deduction will be dollar 7500 paid or dollar 10000 whichever is lower that is how much 7500 right make sense yes no yes sir yes sir hmm? simple yes sir yes sir okay hmm. so now jumping on to the third itemized deduction which is mortgage interest expense mortgage mean loan that is for home loan or home equity loan and the mortgage insurance premium so it covered both interest as well as insurance premium for the mortgage so what is insurance premium for the mortgage do anyone know what is insurance premium for the mortgage any idea what is it hmm? 
Yeah. Vivek, Sachin. Sir, uh, if, uh, if I'm taking a loan from bank, mm -hmm. the uh, bank uh, line my uh, immovable property and this mm -hmm. uh, is loan and uh, he, he pays a premium on this uh, property. Uh, mm -hmm. Then this uh, this insurance premium called the mortgage insurance premium. Mm -hmm. No. Shelly, do you have any idea? No, sir. <laughs> <laughs> Rajat? Shubham, any idea? Sir, if the person who is taking the loan, he he, he takes he, he get bankrupt and he takes the advantage under the section 1095C. So the bank will will be bank will be in a position that will be suffered, but so the so the bank will, whenever they offer the loan, they mm. they take some they put some like the insurance premium. Yes, absolutely true. Absolutely true. So you know when you go for a loan, so what bank look at your source of income, your recurring income, and your credit score. Right? If your source of income or credit score is not meeting uh, the requirement of the loan, then generally the bank will take insurance on the loan amount which they have given from the insurance company. And they make you forced to pay that insurance money, then only they will be giving you the loan. So to ensure the loss of the bank, in case of the person who is taking loan will go bankrupt. Uh, uh, sir, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, 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 it's, it's here in India also. So maybe I'll draw an example and help you understand what exactly it means. Yes. So for example, there is Mr. X. He wants to buy home for dollar 500,000. Let's assume same Texas house. Right. And for that, he put down payment of let's say dollar fifty thousand and he took a loan of dollar four fifty thousand. Right. For this four fifty thousand is being let's say payable in uh, let's say one twenty equal installment EMI, which we call right. So the bank will say, if you go bankrupt, then you will pay me, right? So for this, Mr. X, first, they need to pay interest. Let's say they have taken at the rate of 4%, right? The second thing bank will take like insurance premium. The premium is if you go bankrupt, then I can claim this money from the insurance. Company will pay. So this amount is also being allowed along with the interest. So both of these expenses are being allowed as a itemized deduction. Make sense? Any doubt here? What is the insurance premium? Hmm? Vivek, Shelly, Rajat, Garima? Yeah, okay. Hmm? Rajat, Garima, good? Yes, sir. Yeah, clear, clear. Yes. Cool. Okay, so if you see now, let's go back to the notes and look at what we have written over there. So in this notes, if you see mortgage interest expense and mortgage insurance premium, right? The deduction limit will be mortgage debt should not exceed more than $750,000. If you are taking a loan to purchase your home for more than $750,000, that means you are buying a luxury right? So if you're buying a luxury home, then probably you have the money to pay tax. 
right <laughs> so the government do not encourage to give much deductions to them but if your loan amount is less than $750,000 then you will get the benefit of interest paid and the insurance premium paid and the property should be a qualified residence so in that case qualified residence we'll be discussing in detail where you are living for more than 6 months in a year so that is called qualified residence so this deduction is being allowed as a home loan interest and the insurance premium paid for that but the two condition need to be satisfied first one is you will be living in that property for more than 6 months that means that is your primary home second thing is the loan amount should be less than 750000 dollar if you are taking more than 750000 dollar that means tax maker feel you are buying a luxury home and if you are buying a luxury home that means you have a good paying capacity and if you have a good paying capacity why to give deductions to you make sense and there is no limit or no cap on the interest or insurance premium that is a good thing so interest what you are paying or the insurance premium you are paying whatever is being the amount is being allowed so far these two conditions are met make sense everyone Kamalji, i want to ask if he is getting the loan hmm. how he can be the resident of that house no uh how do you take home loan to purchase the home Nani, to live in that home i yes. want to ask then how a uh, six month condition will you satisfy for the residence qualified resident yeah so for example if you are taking a loan let's say if you are planning to buy a home in the month of august okay right and you have taken a loan in the month of august and then you have started living in that home new home from okay. let's say october you have done all the renovation and you have started living over there from october right then for August to December of that particular year, you cannot claim this. Okay. But in next year, you'll be living there for entire 12 months. Okay. So next year you can claim it. But if you have purchased a home in the month of January or February, right, okay. and you have done some renovation, you have started living there from 1st April. Then you can then, then you can... will then you can claim for the entire year. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Clear. Hmm? Right, very good question. Yeah, you. Yeah. Hmm. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, anyone else have any doubt? So far, so good. Okay, so next one is charitable contribution. So charitable contribution can be in terms of cash, in terms of kind, right? In terms of property or in terms of, uh, you can say, exchange of any goods or service. That is like kind of kind. Right. If the contribution is in cash, then you can avail up to 100% of AGI. What is AGI? Adjusted gross income. Right. So up to 100% of the AGI, you can claim the deduction. Right. And there are three categories of charitable institution. One is public charitable institution. Second is private operating foundation. Third is private non-operating foundation. Right? So for example, public charity trust, which include like uh, you can say your church, right? Religions, places, educational institute or some animal institutions, which is like, you know, like uh, 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 created by the pool of money from the public right second is like private foundations which is like museum research facilities libraries like which may be uh, you can say created by the city uh, government or maybe created by the private person that is called private operating <laughs> foundation third will be private non-operating foundation right Non-operating foundation, I'm sure you might have heard of uh, Bill Gates and Melinda Gates Foundation, 
Have you heard about that foundation, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation? Yes, sir. Yeah, I have heard about Same that. Same way, like we have uh, uh, Walton Family Foundation that Walmart. has been created by Disney, owner of the Disney. Right? Walmart, yeah. Sam, Sam, I think Sam Walton, Walmart founder. No, Walmart is separate. Walton is this owner of Disney. So they also have like their family foundation, Coca-Cola foundation. So these kind of like, you know, private uh, foundations, which has been operating for the social benefit of the societies. Right. So there are three categories of, you can say, charitable institution. One is public charitable institution. In that you can see uh, common public have contributed the money and set up certain trust. For example, uh, any temple or any Gurdwara or any church, right? And maybe any educational institute or maybe any, uh, you can say, uh, institute to support underprivileged students or something like that, right? And uh, then second is private operating foundation. Operating foundation means where there are certain specific operations are happening. For example, any research facilities, library, museum, zoo, or uh, you can say uh, some private research institute, those kind of things. And non-operating foundations mean which is which uh, run purely and purely for the charitable purpose, like uh, but that is being owned by the private, you can say, industrialist in general, right? So if you are giving any contribution in cash to any of these kind of charitable institution, so up to 100% of the AGI is being allowed, right? And if you are giving as an, you can say, in kind, right? In that case of scenario, if you are contributing any, let's say if you are contributing any services to the church, for example, you are providing accounting services to the church, but you are not charging for it. That means you are giving your services in kind, right? So in that case of scenario, what you would have been charged otherwise for that services to any other clients at an arm length basis. So up to 50% of the AGI is being allowed for that, right? And uh, then, and that is for public charities and private operating foundation. But when it comes to private non-operating foundation, that means from the private industrialist, in that case of scenario, up to 30% of the AGI is being allowed. Third is if you are giving any property to them, right? And on that property, if there is any gain to the charitable institution, right? So for that, up to 30% of the AGI has been allowed as a deduction, right? But it is for if it is for private non-operating foundation, then 20% of the AGI. So we'll do like math. Don't worry one by one. We'll go through all. Uh, or maybe let me draw an example, then it will be easy to digest for each of the three examples. So first one is, I think, very simple. If you are going to the church, right? Have you been to the church or any temple or Gurdwara? Yes, sir. Yes. And you are donating something in the donation box in cash, right? So that donation is being allowed as a standard deduction. So far you get the receipt of the donation. That is something you need to submit, right? Up to 100% of the AGI. What is AGI? Yeah. What is the full form of AGI? Adjusted gross income. Adjusted gross income. For example, the income is dollar two hundred thousand right and the allowed expense is dollar sixty thousand right so your gross income adjusted gross income is how much dollar two hundred 
140,000, right? For year you have dollar 140,000 income, right? So first scenario, first scenario, you have done a cash contribution of let's say dollar 10,000 you have donated. Second scenario, you have donated dollar 500,000 cash. Second scenario is being providing services. to charge or worth dollar, let's say 20,000 or dollar 200,000, right? So we are, we are keeping two, two scenario for each situation as an example. Third is you have provided, let's say, a fixed assets, let, let's say you have provided a truck you have donated a truck to a charity. Hmm? Let's say a truck uh, or instead of truck, if you have donated, let's say land. Land to charity on which you have capital gain. of dollar let's say 50,000 or let's say dollars 250,000. Okay, it could be long term, yeah? Yeah, it can be long term or it can be short term. Let's, let's assume these are the three scenarios, right? So now looking at the first scenario, first scenario says cash contribution $10,000 or 500,000 more. So maximum is 100% of AGI, that is dollar 140,000, right? So this 10,000 or 140,000, whichever is lower, that means this is allowed, right? But in the second scenario, in the second scenario, this one will be allowed 140,000 or 500,000, whichever is lower. Make sense? Cash contribution, straightforward. Yeah. Shubham, yes, Rajat, Garima, yeah. Vivek. Clear cash contribution. So in the first scenario, 10,000 or 140,000, whichever is lower, that is 10,000, right? In the second scenario, you have contributed 500,000, but the maximum allowed deduction is 100% of AGI. What is 100% of AGI? Dollar 140,000? Yes, no? Yes. Yes. Right? So in the second scenario, the maximum deduction you can claim is 140,000 dollar. Hmm? Now coming to the services. So in terms of services, maximum, let's say it's a public trust. Hmm? So let's say maximum is 50% of AGI. That is dollar 70,000. Yes. What is 50% of 140,000? 70,000. 70,000? Yes. Right. So maximum allowed is 70,000. So in the first case, 20,000 or 70,000, whichever is lower, that means 20,000 is allowed. Yes. And in second case, 200,000 or 70,000, whichever is 70, lower. Yes. So in that case, this will be allowed. Right? Third scenario is providing long-term capital assets. And you have some gain on those transfers, right? So in that case of scenario, maximum is 30% of AGI. 30% of the AGI, 30% of 140 is? 
How much? Can you do the math for me? Excuse me, sir. Yes, please. Uh, sir, ये जो आप बोल रहे हैं, uh, which is he have a game? तो इसका थोड़ा elaborate कर दीजिए. Sorry, sir. दोबारा बोलना सुनिए. Third point है ये land to charity, which he have raised long term capital या short term of capital gain. इसका क्या मतलब है? हाँ. So for example. Let's say you have purchased a land hmm, for one hundred thousand dollars, right? Let's say you have purchased that land on first January twenty twenty, and you have donated that land to the charitable institution. Let's say for the trust, okay. right? The time you have donated that land, the market value of land was hundred and fifty thousand dollars, right? So market value was One fifty thousand dollar, and you have purchased for hundred thousand dollar. If you have been sold to anyone else, you could have been sold it for one fifty thousand dollar. Okay. Right. So difference of fifty thousand is your capital gain on transfer. Okay. So we'll be discussing that in chapter two, but yeah. high level, this is the concept. Uh, no, I person is eligible only if he taking a. Again, on this property. Yes, yes, yes. Again, the loss. Then, then, uh, then, mm -hmm. then uh, is not get, getting any deduction. Yes, on loss, why you require deduction? You'll be claiming loss full amount. No, हाँ तो फिर मेरे को दोनों तरफ नुकसान हो गया ना property भी नुकसान में गई और जब मैंने वो property दी उसका भी deduction नहीं मिला तो no, no 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 you 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 will claim the loss. उजेंड्रउ Uh, this truck you might have hit somewhere, and uh, on first uh, January twenty two, the market value of truck is let's say dollar five thousand, hmm? and you have already claimed let's say depreciation of dollar two thousand. So your book value. Book value of truck is dollar eight thousand, hmm? and now you are transferring this truck to the church. Okay. Hmm? Which is like market value is five thousand dollar. Okay. Right. So in that case of scenario, for this eight thousand dollar minus five thousand dollar, that will be your loss. Okay. And that loss you will be claiming here. It's already allowed. That's an allowable loss, right? Okay. And then the five thousand dollar which you are giving as a capital assets to the trust or to the church. For that you will be claiming charitable contribution. Right, my. Deduction. Okay, but uh, you you say that uh, if I I getting a profit, then only we I will be eligible to taking a deduction. In this case, uh, I am taking a loss. Uh, in, uh, if in as market value is down, then also I also was uh, eligible to get a deduction. In in this uh, example. Ah uh, no. Uh... When we go back to the notes, let me go back to the notes. I can do what we are saying. Let me present my screen to the notes one. So, if you see this ordinary income, right? So that will go to the fifty, fifty, and thirty percent category. But when there is a long-term capital gain from the property, so those gain. Will be come under the thirty percent category. That means when you are giving that in a kind, 
then those 50 those will come into the 50 percent when you are providing this uh one second here so you are giving this uh, let's say another property uh, one second for the loss you understand like this 5000 will go in category of 50 percent when you are contributing in kind hmm? but okay. for example if this truck has let's say market value increase to dollar 12000 market value increase to dollar 12000 and you have book value of $8,000. That means you have a long term capital gain of dollar. How much? $4,000? Hmm? Yes. And the other breakup which you have is the book value dollar $8,000. Hmm? So this $8,000 will go in the category of 50% and this $4,000 will go in the category of 30%. That's what I mean to say about the long-term capital gain. So this, which is going in terms of kind, for that it is 20%, 50%, and which is this portion, which is long-term capital gain, that will be 30%. Make sense? That is the reason point consider only long-term capital gain. In case of loss, it will come in the kind category and you'll be getting the benefit of 50%. Okay, sir. Now this is a clear. Mm, I need to update the note. Thank you, sir. Yeah, no, thanks for bringing this point. I think this is benefit for everyone. I'll update the, in the notes as well before I sharing this with you. Right. So this table is clear. So if you are contributing in cash, then up to 100% of the adjusted gross income is allowed. If you are contributing in kind, that is either goods, services or capital good. Right. For that, 50% of AGI for public charitable institution private operating foundation 50% and private non-operating foundation is 30%, right? And the long-term capital gain, only the gain portion will be tax at a rate of 30%, right? Make sense, okay. everyone? Second, second. Mm -hmm. One second, go back to the... So if you see here, the second one is providing services or in kind. So here we took an example of, let's say, accounting services, which you have provided. The market value of that accounting service is $20,000 or another scenario we have taken is $200,000, right? For that maximum you can allow is up to 50% of the AGI. 50% of AGI, what is your AGI? 140,000, right? And what is the 50% of 140,000? 70,000, right? Huh? Sachin? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Right? So the allowable limit is maximum 70,000. So in first case of scenario, 20,000 or 70,000, whichever is lower, that means this 20,000 is allowed. In second scenario, when you are providing the services, or providing the goods for 200,000. In that case of scenario, 70,000 is being allowed as an itemized deduction. Okay, sir. Uh, jo beach mein aapne bracket mein likha hua property and rent, is, iske, isse exact karke, sir, ek bar example. So, for example, if you have given any property on rent, let's say, for example, uh, 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 let's say, for example, uh, uh, if you have a banquet hall, okay. right? If you have a banquet hall and church wants to do some annual event over there, okay. right? And you have provided that banquet hall free of cost to the church to do that event. 
Hmm? So normally, if you let's say in the market, you charge a rent for that banquet hall in the two twenty thousand dollar. Okay. Right. Then you are providing that rental income free to the charity as a charitable contribution. So your charitable contribution is twenty thousand dollar, which otherwise you could have been charged from any other client. Okay. Sir. Right. Make sense. Yes. Any other doubt, guys? Mayank, Shubham, no, sir, not yet, sir. Rajat. Everyone good? Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay. So, CARES Act has increased the cash contribution limit from sixty to hundred percent. But it's still continuing. Hmm? So excess charitable contribution can be carry forward and be carry forward up to five years, subject to the percentage limit of AGI. So, what does it mean? It means if you see in this earlier example which we have discussed. So, in the first scenario, if you see the second part of the first scenario, you have given a cash contribution of how much? Five hundred thousand dollar, right? And the maximum limit allowed was. One forty thousand dollar. So, how much was not allowed in that year? How much was not allowed in the year one? Three hundred sixty. Three sixty. Right. So, dollar five hundred thousand, which you have paid, minus dollar one forty thousand. So, dollar three sixty thousand was not allowed. Have not. in year one right but this three sixty thousand dollar can be carry forward okay up to five years what does it mean it means let's say now you are in year two hmm? in year two you have income of let's say dollar two hundred thousand, and you have let's say expenses of this year dollar eighty thousand, and your AGI is dollar how much one twenty thousand, right? So in this year, you will see maximum allowable limit is. Or cash contribution is hundred percent of AGI. That is dollar one twenty thousand, right? And you have a carry forward. You have a carry forward dollar three sixty thousand cash contribution. That means in this year one twenty thousand or three sixty thousand, whichever is lower. Is allowed, right? So in this year, one twenty thousand is allowed, right? And let's say, let's say year three. So year three, how much will be the carry forward? Three sixty thousand minus one twenty thousand, which you have taken. That is dollar two forty thousand is carry forward. Everyone. With me, yes. right? Let's say in year three you have AGI of dollar two hundred thousand. In that case, which one is allowed? Up to two hundred thousand is being allowed in year three, right? AGI. Yes, right. So carry forward will be 
how much dollar 40000 right and then in year 3 if you have agi of let's say dollar 250000 dollar in that case of scenario whichever is lower that means up to 40000 is being allowed in the year 4 right this can be carry forward maximum up to how many years 5 five. 5 five years right so up to 5 year this will be considered as a cash contribution of that particular year and you can avail the benefit of itemized deduction on a charitable contribution right any doubt on carry forward concept no no, no sir right tax payer must retain proper documentation of any contribution made for more than 250000 dollar any contribution which you are claiming on your income tax return for more than 250 dollar in a year you should have a proper receipt acknowledged by that charitable institution as a documentation right make sense yes no Hmm? Yes. Okay. So far, we have covered medical and dental care expenses, state and local taxes, mortgage interest, and mortgage insurance premium, and charitable contribution. Now we are jumping onto the fifth one, which is investment expense. so investment expenses that means expenses which you have incurred to earn the investment income right for example if you have paid any brokerage charges right when you are purchasing the securities on which you are earning some interest or dividend right so certain expenditure which you have incurred to earn the investment income is being allowed as an itemized deduction as well hmm? so deduction limit to the extent incurred to earn the investment income and interest income so maximum amount which is being allowed is the total income you have earned from those investment right if you have spent more than what you have earned then there are some carry forward provision but in the current year you cannot claim that from your routine income why this provision has been kept over here like people used to show the losses from the investment income and then they were setting off those losses from their operating income which is not ethical practice right that is the reason law maker have restricted the amount to the extent people are earning income from the investment they can claim up to that much amount as a deduction if they have more than that spent then that amount can be carry forward so tax payer reasons to uh, so these are like five itemized deduction so what are five itemized deductions are medical and dental care expenses state and local taxes expenses mortgage interest and insurance premium expenses charitable contribution and the last one is investment expense right so these are the only five itemized deduction available to the available to the tax payer in united state of america then standard deduction is being available for all tax payer in united state of america yes no is standard deduction available to all the tax payers yeah yeah no no <laughs> are you sure yes or yeah, are you sure no huh to whom standard deduction is available alien ko nahi hai residential wo kaun se ho yes so non resident alien are not allowed the standard deduction they are only allowed for the itemized deduction right they wants to protect the interest of their citizen and their resident 
and they want to take maximum taxes from the non resident alien right uh, under, that is the point 2 or point 3 of the standard deduction like the like federal taxes federal means like the like the amount which we owe to the irs if the irs send us some notice like the amount we kind of owe to the irs is it like is it mean federal taxes so sorry like show my i didn't understand your question like so you saying सर जो इसके ऊपर था लाइक द स्टेट एंड द लोकल टैक्सेस ओके इन द ब्रैकेट इट इज रिटन फेडरल फेडरल मींस लाइक द आईआरएस टैक्सेस या यस यस सो इन यूएस लाइक इफ यू रिमेंबर इन द फर्स्ट क्लास देयर आर थ्री कैटेगरी ऑफ टैक्सेस वन इज फेडरल टैक्सेस व्हिच इज टू द सेंट्रल गवर्नमेंट इफ यू लुक एट इन कॉन्टेक्स्ट ऑफ इंडिया लाइक टू द सेंट्रल गवर्नमेंट एनी टैक्सेस लेविड बाय द सेंट्रल गवर्नमेंट second is state government so like in us there are 55 state and every state uh, uh, have certain state taxes right for example like in most of the states the state tax is in a range of 6 to 8% if you see like federal tax rate generally in a, uh, they are around like 24% or 26% i think so and for state it vary from 6% to 8% depending on state to state and then there are certain taxes which need to pay to the uh, municipality or city taxes so that again vary from city to city for new york city it's very high for city like you know michigan or maybe detroit it may be very less so here what we are studying all together is being federal taxation but when you are doing calculation for the federal taxation so itemized deduction in terms of itemized deduction you can claim the state taxes which you have paid or the local taxes or municipality taxes you have paid up to $10000 make sense shubham yes sir so when you purchase any property you need to pay state tax right or uh, 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 in your income tax return if like Uh, you are already there in US. You might have seen in your W two form. So if you uh, if you remember, like in uh, last class, we have discussed that W two form also. There are also three categories of taxes. Maybe I can show you again. So W two is like similar to form sixteen, which we get. So here, if you see federal tax. Withheld, federal tax withheld by the employer, social security tax withheld, then Medicare tax withheld, right? And now here, if you see state income tax, so for that you will be calculating the income taxable for the state and the state income tax, then wages for the local taxes. and the local income tax so there are three category of taxes which employer would be also charging from your salary account is being for the federal for state and for the local taxes make sense do you remember this we have discussed in the last class last week class sorry Yeah, Shubham. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. So now we are done with itemized deduction.